afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for being here on a Sunday afternoon, second last session of the day. Um, yeah, today I'm going to tell you about um, my journey over the last 18 months uh, in, my, in my most recent job, where we um, have deployed a new big Python-powered product in a big organization um, with a really good team. Uh, it's a bit of a cautionary tale, uh, so in the spirit of publishing negative results, I'm going to go through the kind of mistakes that we made along the way. Um, I've not spoken about it before, so hopefully it's going to be a bit of a therapy session for me to get all of the, uh, <laughs> all the demons out. Um, it's going to be quite similar to some other talks that have, been, that have gone on in the past. It's quite a, um, there's a lot of people with takes on this subject, but um, I'm going to kind of hopefully put a bit of a different uh, perspective on it. So as an overview of what I'm going to talk about, um, I thought I'd do it as an airflow DAG, because uh, <laughs> trendy new technologies. Uh, I'll do a quick intro on me and the team. I'll try not to spend too long on that, even though I'm very narcissistic. Um, I'm going to then go through the product that we built at the BBC, um, which is a mobile app, and the technology choices we made. I'm going to hopefully go into a bit of a bit of detail about those technologies because this is uh, I mark this as a kind of a novice session, and it would be good to warn people on the, on the kind of um, pitfalls of some of that as we go. Um, and then, yeah, just as a last caveat, um, this is a year run from when we uh, started this project, so perhaps some of the messages and some of my criticisms and some of my praises might be out of date. Um, but yeah, let's go. So uh, this is me, kind of. I haven't really been able to choose a profession over the last 10 years or so, so I've done a few different things, most of it in software, but most of it in research. So um, I started off after my electronic engineering degree doing a, a PhD in trains, where I did a lot of stuff to do with the semantic web. So uh, this isn't the first presentation I've given on like, what technologies not to use. Um, I then started with BBC Research and Development a few years ago and had the luxury of working on quite a few really fun projects. I did some software-defined radio stuff in uh, Python New Radio, which is really cool. Um, some audio thumbnailing stuff in Python and then some kind of web prototyping stuff in Node.js and that kind of thing. Uh, nowadays, I'm a, um, a data engineer by, by name, although I'm kind of doing half software engineering, half data engineering for quite a new team. So I don't know who was here in uh, 2018, this time a year ago. Uh, my colleague Theo did a presentation on the semantic web and how it was going to be amazing and how we were going to use it. Not gone quite to plan, but um, that's the same team that I'm in. Um, I think we have about 30 people overall in the team now. Um, we're a centralized machine learning team in the BBC. There's a lot of other teams doing data science of various types, but we're a kind of a, um, a central kind of hub of supposed expertise. Um, there's about 12 devs slash scientists on the team and we work together um, and we're supported by a really good product team. We mostly do recommendations and we work together so we don't have the data scientists throw work over the fence to the engineers for productionization. We try to pair on everything and try to um, come up with uh, products that are kind of sustainable. In short, um, this is what Datalab does. We take uh, BBC content, um, BBC has a huge amount of content, it's our main business. Um, uh, uh, metadata about the content, which we're also fortunately really good at. We've got all of our metadata about the TV programs, radio programs, and the website all in one place so that we can get to it. It's not particularly rich, but it's all right. Um, and audience data, so we, um, we track what signed in users have um, watched and listened to. Um, and we allow them to explicitly personalize some bits of the website. So we take all that stuff and we use that to provide recommendations of content uh, for, for them. So a year ago, uh, the team had just formed and we were a kind of a technology team looking for a problem. So I said we were a machine learning team. Um, we didn't actually get employed to solve any specific problem. We thought we'd find it as we go. And the first thing we did was uh, what every trendy new team does and build a mobile app. So the BBC has a bit of a problem that um, our, when you ask people to describe the BBC in terms of a person, most people say like 55-year-old man, um, Radio 4, not much for the young people at all. So we thought that by trying to create a, an experience to deliver short-form content in a more of a discoverable way, a bit like, I mean, 
don't know if this resembles any other app for you, but um, yeah, then maybe we could uh, entice them in and, and, and serve those audiences a bit more effectively. So we built a mobile app. We employed an app team, uh, and we had no idea really what we were doing besides recommendations. This is where all the problems started. So uh, about, well, 18 months ago, we were talking about this app. We had the beginnings of a team to build the front end of the app. Thankfully, we didn't do that. Um, and there were all these phrases being bandied about. So we'll have other customers. We need to build a platform. We need to make everything reusable because this isn't going to be the only product we build. Um, we're a new team. We've got buy-in from all the management so we can try a load of new technology. Um, we don't really know what the requirements are yet, but we can just build flexibly. Never do that. So our response to all this was um, just to go dive into all of the new things that were being talked about. Um, we were quite into exploring uh, Google, Google Cloud Platform. Um, most of the BBC is on AWS, so we thought, oh, we'll do something different. We use Google. And they recommended a whole host of solutions as well. Now, these are all really good, really good things. Um, but if you're a small team, you probably don't want to buy into all of them at once. Um, the next bit of the presentation is going to be a little bit towards the kind of software engineering deployment side, but I'll try and bring it back to data and science as we go on. So I'm now going to talk through uh, the specific technology choices that we made, what kind of worked and what didn't work. Um, a lot of it didn't work. First thing, microservices. Who's built stuff with microservices? Cool, and there's a lot of skepticism there, that's good. Um, microservices are, are meant to be, uh, is meant to be a, a way of designing software that, so that you can break everything down into the smallest possible components, deploy them independently, and then you can scale each bit of the software so that you can get the most out of your compute infrastructure. That's really great if you're building a kind of a, a platform that's serving millions of users. Uh, we didn't have any users, and we decided to build something, I think I, think I counted 17 boxes on this diagram. Now, that's fine, um, but I think we probably could have done it with three. Uh, we had a kind of a recommendations component in the middle in green, uh, a data ingest component, which is the purple bit at the bottom, which is um, grabbing all of the new stuff that the content creators are making, and then a client API to talk to the app up in orange. Um, but, you know, we chose this. Um, it didn't go too badly, but the, the problem is when you have 17 different components, any of the practical things that you do, so deployment, CI, code quality, uh, onboarding, it's all multiplied 17 times. You can't just do something with one repository. As an alternative to that, if I was starting again now, I'd probably just try deploying on a single VM or using something like Heroku where you can just push your code to Git and see it working immediately. And then as we scaled out, we could have then refactored and tried something different. It's good to throw code away. Uh, just as some proof, um, this is our team, not the whole BBC, this is our team, which uh, has 24 members, 80 repositories in it at the moment. It gets to be a bit of a headache. Next technology. Um, when you've got 17 components, uh, you really need a, a really trendy way of interfacing between them. So uh, if you were going to build two services connected by a network, uh, what technology would you use to communicate between them? Anyone? Th yeah, okay. REST. And then he said gRPC. This is gRPC. Um, it's a way of doing uh, remote procedure calls over a network um, that Google have uh, developed over the last couple of years. It's kind of really cool because it's meant to be really quick. Um, it allows you to write Python code and interface with uh, your other applications as if they're libraries. Uh, and it uses cool technology, binary over HTTP2, is meant to be really, really good. And it generates um, skeleton code for you. This is, um, this is Python 3 code with, uh, yeah, um, methods that are upper camel case and all sorts, and we can't change that. So, um, yeah, really good in practice. Um, sorry, really good in theory, but in practice, uh, there's no tooling. There's, there's basically one command line utility called grp curl, which you have to compile from source. Nobody in the team knew it, um, and uh, all of the problems were really hard to debug. 
So, um, yeah, it, it's got these, these theoretical advantages. You can do um, really nice API changes because thing, you can design APIs to be backward compatible. But in reality, until you're at scale, just use, um, just use REST APIs or even don't bother with the RESTful stuff. Anything over HTTP is fine. Um, just as an addendum as well, the, Py the gRPC is meant to be, meant to be fast. Uh, the Python implementation is about a tenth as fast as the Go implementation. So you're really not gaining very much. So the verdict, uh, the price paid by the team is way too high. Just use proven technology. Okay, so we're going a bit higher level now. When you work at a big company, uh, like Google, Airbnb, Netflix, whatever, they tend to have ways of developing in the cloud for very good reason. They have their established ways in-house and everything's a bit different. At the BBC, we're not quite at that scale, but we have a really good team in-house that, that helps us with our cloud infrastructure. A few years ago, they gave a talk at AWS reInvent about the, the new framework they, went, they were going to get the whole of the BBC to use to deploy software to the cloud. It's called Cosmos and it's actually really good. So um, as long as you can get your Python code or your, your JavaScript code or anything you're writing into a CentOS RPM package, so into a Linux installable thing, you can use this system and get stuff deployed with autoscalers on Amazon with all the security you need, um, no problem at all. So you get for free monitoring, access control, security, reproducibility. If I want to limit my web app just to um, BBC developers, I can just say um, dependency, um, developer sets, BBC, and that will put a reverse proxy in front of everything, which will only allow people with BBC client certificates in. So why would we leave this behind? Well, because we're a new team and we're trying new stuff. So this is the, uh, the front, oh, you can't really see that, can you? This is the front page of uh, the, the Google Cloud Platform um, sales pitch. Um, and that's what we decided to go with. So everything at the BBC is on Amazon. We don't want to be too locked into one cloud provider. So we even got someone up high saying, oh yeah, you should try GCP. Like, let's try and do something in another cloud. Um, and we were really excited because there's all of this new stuff. There's a load of really cool machine learning tooling. There's a load of um, kind of um, pre-rolled APIs you can use. Um, and then there's all this other stuff that we'll never touch. Um, but we kind of forgot about all the stuff that the team in, uh, in the central BBC had built for us on Amazon. So we had to just completely start again. So all of the access control, even, um, even monitoring, we just had to start again. So when you start using Google Cloud, what's the natural thing to do? You don't just use VMs. You don't just build stuff in the, in the same way that you ever had. Uh, you use Docker and Kubernetes. Now, I actually really like uh, Docker. I've been using it for prototyping things for ages. And I think unless there's any security professionals in the room, I think most people kind of find it quite, quite good. Um, the security implications are a little bit weird. And um, so that's why we're not using the rest of the BBC yet. But um, in general, um, Docker allows you to take your application, install it as if it's on a fresh computer, and then package that up into a container. That container will run identically in any environment as long as you've got the, um, the Linux hypervisor. Um, and so you've got this, this, this kind of self-contained artifact that you can just treat as a thing and version. Um, Kubernetes uh, is really cool as well. Um, I really, really like it having used it for a year. It's a container orchestrator. So um, rather than in something like Amazon Web Services or wherever you would declare your infrastructure as code, you declare your auto-scaling uh, and bring up an Amazon auto-scaler, you declare um, your load balancing and your security policies. You can do that all as um, declarative manifests in this system called Kubernetes. Install Kubernetes on all of your servers and then uh, that piece of software will work out where to run all of your applications and where to redirect all of your traffic. So it's really cool, but really complicated. Um, what helped a little bit was that we used Google's managed version of Kubernetes, which I'd highly recommend. If you are going to go for something as complicated as this, then don't roll it yourself. Use a, some cloud provider's version. Um, just as a little illustration at the bottom, because the, the slide was a bit boring, um, if you've got a few different applications, which are these different, different shaped, uh, different colored shapes, 
um, Kubernetes will just make sure that you're making the best use out of all of the capacity that you're paying for. So finally, in terms of uh, the technology from the deployment side that I'm going to talk about, I think, what's that, three or four brand new things that I've already introduced in a team of what was then about eight people. Uh, we needed a continuous delivery so, uh, solution because when you're building software, you want to iterate, you want to fail fast, you want to do all these great things. And in order to do that, you can't just use um, your standard out of the box, uh, been around for ages, continuous delivery system. Um, the BBC has a, a customized version of Jenkins that you can deploy in about half an hour. No, we wanted to use something that you could do blue-green deployments, you could do multivariate testing out of the box. Um, and it's got a shiny new user interface. So we chose um, a piece of software called Spinnaker, which is a, a kind of a multi-cloud, um, multi-target continuous delivery system. Again, like most of these technologies I've mentioned, Spinnaker is really cool. So um, you can describe your infrastructure, you can put it in there, you can tell it how you want it to de deploy things, you can build pipelines so that if you're deploying a new algorithm or a new piece of software, uh, a new version can go through a series of steps. You can do manual intervention and then eventually promote it to production. The problem is this gets installed, well, there's no managed service for this. It's us running it on our Kubernetes cluster, which we've only just learned how to use. And it installs about 40 different components. Uh, so we had more downtime and more incidents as a result of this piece of software than we did any of the bugs that we'd written in our Python code. Just a disclaimer, I think since we got rid of this last year, it's come on quite a way, and a lot of the bugs and a lot of the um, misconceptions that we have have uh, disappeared, and the documentation's got a lot better. So if you're in the market for a, for a complicated continuous delivery system, this is probably the thing to go for, not for us. So eventually we ripped it out, um, and we replaced it with um, a Git repo with all of our code just in there as YAML files and a hook into the Google Cloud. So if we want to deploy a new piece of software now, we uh, build the Docker image, push it up to Docker manually, and then change a manifest on GitHub, press go, do a code review, and it goes into stage, and then we promote it into prod. Um, that seems like a bit of a clunky process because when I'm editing the image manually, I could get it wrong. But we've had no problems with this in the last six months and we had so many problems with the previous approach. So um, go as simple as possible, and, and you'll, be, you'll be grand. Uh, just to illustrate that, um, look at how many Slack emojis we got once we, uh, once we deleted Spinnaker. I don't even know what some of them are. <laughs> so all of that happened over about the first eight months of 2018. We were building this product on these new technologies. We were learning new things, which was really fun. Um, but it took ages. Um, and then the kind of the, the last four months as we were um, releasing this product to the public, it's now available on all your favorite app stores, by the way, um, we decided to scale it in a little bit and we learned some lessons. So um, our pace dropped significantly in the first part of 2018 from what we'd expected. Uh, we ended up with quite low confidence in the code that we were building and quite because we didn't have a really easy way of testing things locally. Our microservices didn't have the right boundaries, uh, so changing things was a bit risky. The 50% data scientists in our team uh, ended up working on infrastructure because there was so much of a burden on infrastructure. So the data science we were doing moved slowly as well, um, and bugs compounded. I say team morale dropped. Uh, we were all lovely people, so we all carried on enjoying working there. Um, one last thing. Uh, by this point, we still didn't have an ingest pipeline, and we thought, you know what, let's get rid of the microservices, let's just build something that works. We spent about three weeks uh, building a single Python package that um, listened for events coming in from our, um, our metadata provider, did it all synchronously, so this took about three seconds per request, and then dumped everything into Elasticsearch. Oh, Elasticsearch, by the way, that's a database that everybody uses. It's got high Google ability, so we had no problems with that whatsoever. Um, yeah, so really inelegant solution, slow and inefficient. Um, the data that, come, that ends up in Elasticsearch isn't even particularly consistent, and it doesn't handle errors very well. But it's good enough. Um, 
if this does glitch out in any way, it will send a, a 4xx response back to um, the Amazon simple notification service, and it will try again later. Um, nowadays, we are thinking of swapping it out, but for, for 12 months, that's worked perfectly. Another good thing, um, Jupyter Hub. This is the one piece of new technology that we've used that has really, really helped us. Um, I said that data science is moving slowly. Um, since installing this, uh, our data scientists have been able to work a lot more effectively. Um, you probably, most of you know what Jupyter Hub is already, but effectively it's a um, software as a service that you can install yourself or pay for a, a hosted solution uh, that allows your developers or data scientists to have an IDE or a Jupyter notebook uh, running in the cloud on some compute resources that get provisioned for that user. So um, if I want to go and do some really gnarly deep learning problem, I can go, in, go onto our Jupyter Hub um, URL. I can say, I want a really big computer, press go, and it will spin me up an interface where all of this code runs uh, in that really big computer. Google have just launched or relaunched their uh, Jupyter Notebook uh, offering on the cloud, so we might look back at that. Um, but at the time, launching our own version, writing the install scripts, knowing exactly what was going on was much more valuable than going to somebody else who was doing a cloud offering and not having any idea what was installed. Other good ideas, um, Elasticsearch, uh, managed logging. So Google provides a logging solution, which uh, most people haven't used before, but using that over um, rolling our own uh, saves us a lot of time. Uh, managed machine learning model training, um, Google ML Engine, which is now called something like Google AI Hub Train, allows you to write a Python package that, that, that solves some problem, um, send a command line, uh, command to, the, to their API, upload the Python uh, code into the cloud, run it, and it gets you back results. So that means that you can do your data science without having to worry about infrastructure at all. That's the trendy technology that's actually good. And then um, this is a bit of a painful one, but for now we're committing to using TensorFlow for as many of our uh, recommendation engine machine learning tasks as possible, not because it's necessarily the best in class framework, but because the Google estate that we're in is so um, optimized for, for solving TensorFlow problems. Lessons learned. Um, this idea of known unknowns versus unknown unknowns. Um, when you choose these new technologies, it's very easy to think that they're uh, the best thing ever, but you don't know what you don't know. Um, when you form a new team, I think this probably goes for any size of company, uh, you really need to be careful with decision making. Um, because we're all lovely people in Data Lab, uh, we initially didn't really raise any objections to any suggestions. So someone would say, oh, there's this new cool thing, we could use that to do this. And everyone would go, yeah, that's a great idea, let's try it. Um, <laughs> that's not the way you should do things. Um, and the other thing, especially in the BBC, it's easier to over-engineer a solution uh, than it is to navigate organizational politics. So it's often easier to just get your head down and code stuff than it is suggesting that we do some user research to start with. On that topic, uh, so this is um, a graph showing the Dunning-Kruger effect from Wikipedia. This is the idea that um, as your expertise on a subject um, goes up, your confidence drops. So before you started, or when you've just got into it, when you've just gone to see a talk at PyData about some technology, you think it's great, and you do the tutorial, and everything's cool, and you adopt it. But as you learn more, you find the glitches, and you find the places where it doesn't work and your, um, your, your confidence in it, in it drops. Um, this happened with basically all of our technologies. Some of them were coming out the other end, some of them we abandoned. Um, why do individuals fall for this? Uh, well, there's um, this kind of selection bias of people only talk at meetups and conferences and only publish blog articles on their successes. You don't really see people publishing um, their failures, particularly. So when you see this trendy new package, you're only hearing from the people who it worked for. Uh, and then maybe this effect of CV-driven development where I can now put Kubernetes on my CV, I can now put Spinnaker on my CV, uh, and all of this stuff. Uh, Dan McKinley did a, a, a very similar talk on this subject a few years ago, uh, but with more of an emphasis on 
the kind of long-term maintainability of code. Um, and he said, the grim paradox of this law of software is that you should probably be using the tool that you hate the most. You hate it because you know the most about it. So um, yeah, just go back to that Postgres database. Oh yeah, the other thing. People always say, oh yeah, but it's different here. We're solving a new problem. It's probably not true. So um, I thought I'd try and analyze why, uh, or from a really informal point of view, why this was really a problem. And I realized that early on, we had so many stages going from uh, developing an algorithm or developing a feature in a piece of software through to deploying it to a point where the audience can see it, that there was only one member of the team that had expertise in each stage. So if you go from left to right, um, first of all, you have to start at the local dev developer environment. That was uh, so, that's so that you can um, try your software locally and make sure it interacts with the other services properly. That's really complicated, so we need the help from one of the developers. You then write your feature. Uh, you then have to change something about the gRPC interface. Um, that's not straightforward either because there's no documentation, so you have to ask somebody else. This goes on. Um, if you assume that it probably takes about half a day to get someone to come and help you, that means that you've spent two and a half days uh, without thinking about the actual writing of the feature, just waiting for other people to help. Um, and if you compare that to the same thing running on the kind of established BBC infrastructure, the only thing you have to do is, as a new starter at the BBC, learn how that Cosmos system works. That would probably take a couple of weeks, um, but then you can do everything yourself. Um, yeah, uh, if you have a monolithic app or if you have just a few components rather than lots of components, then uh, you don't need to be spinning up new infrastructure every time you make a change. Um, don't look at the next bit too closely, but I did try to model um, what the cost of um, adopting these new technologies was. So um, that's a bit blurry, isn't it? I'll try and explain it. Uh, Dan McKinley, in, in his uh, Use Boring Technology talk, uh, defined risk as total maintenance cost of a technology minus uh, the total benefit. Um, I've kind of modified that a little bit, and I've uh, introduced this idea of kind of a pace cost or a cost to developers in the, in the short term. Um, so I've put risk is um, kind of inverse maturity plus inverse support, so um, uh, a, a, an immature technology that has very little documentation or support get high risk. Um, and then you subtract the, familiar, the familiarity or the expertise in the team from that to get your kind of pace cost. You can then combine that with the, the, the total cost that uh, Dan McKinley described uh, by, yeah, effectively adding the maintenance cost that you've already uh, estimated with the, the, with the pace cost. Um, and to try that out, this is not perfect by any means, and um, any uh, statisticians are welcome to come and help me out afterwards. Um, you can start to get numbers uh, which you should definitely not rely on for the different technologies. So uh, Spinnaker, adopting that cost me 1.4. Adopting Airflow cost me 0.5. Adopting Postgres, because we all know it and we all understand it, cost me, well, not nothing, but close to nothing. So really briefly, um, our next challenge. We've basically got the same thing now that we had last January. We, we're embarking on a new problem and we want to pick the right technologies and the right approaches to solve it. Um, we're now working on proper recommendation systems that we're, w that we're giving to other uh, clients within the BBC that we don't have to worry about uh, running ourselves. So the emphasis from the engineering point of view is to try and allow the data scientists to do their work reproducibly um, and quickly, so that not leaving their laptop on overnight training a model. We want continuous integration because we want to be able to um, continue working. Um, and, and we want reproducible data. So the knee-jerk knee reaction is to go to all of the trendy technologies that we've been hearing about. Um, <laughs> I'm really sad that I missed the, uh, the talk on productionized machine learning yesterday. Um, I'll have to look it up on YouTube um, later, but I'm sure there's some uh, far more sensible suggestions. Um, I don't know what half of these really do. And I certainly don't know where the downfalls and, and things are. Um, 
I've already started to identify what they don't do, which is good. But we're not going to do that this time. So a run model algorithm comes up with different costs for some of these things. Uh, you notice that Jenkins at the bottom, just using an existing CI system for your machine learning stuff and having to do a load of the stuff manually and not having highly efficient um, training might be the best approach, we don't know. Um, so at the moment, we are going to try and solve our problems with virtual machines, with Jenkins, and then as we go on, do a few spikes, which we'll guard really closely on some of these new technologies, and then think really hard about adopting them. So final thoughts. Uh, this is probably like being a broken record by now. Um, fit your problem to your existing technology. Uh, it's kind of easier to um, kind of bodge a solution based on something you've already got running in your organization than it is to run a new thing. Um, shiny, new, shiny new technologies are always alluring. A lot of the open source projects uh, from the big uh, tech companies have got marketing teams and, and, and branding people and they look really awesome. Um, and there's no shortcut for genuine expertise. So um, it's really easy to think, oh yeah, I'll become an expert in that in the next six months or so. But really, like, a, you know, an expert is five years or more. Um, so don't adopt something unless you're willing to commit. Um, yeah, so that's it. Thanks very much. I get that um, your recommendation is don't pick new technology if you can avoid to. Uh, but occasionally you do need to, because you're working in a language that your existing tool doesn't support. Yeah. What have you learned about how you evaluate new things that you look at in order to accept or reject them as quickly as possible? I think the trickiest thing at the moment, particularly where we're trying to de continue delivering things as products, is guarding the time that it takes to properly explore and spike out a new technology. So you can't just spend two days on something and then build a prototype, because by the time you've built the prototype, the product team don't necessarily want you to rewrite it from scratch. Um, so really spend that initial time investigating things properly uh, and try and hear from people that have actually battle tested it, I guess. Um, yeah, I think I've probably got a lot more thoughts on that, but I have to chat afterwards, I guess. Thank you very much for the talk, a very important topic. Uh, wanted to ask, like in uh, big organizations, from my experience, a lot of, there is a lot of legacy, especially for the data, and there is a lot of like blockers just to get the data into a new fancy system. Mm. Whereas in your case, it seems not a problem at all. So can you please cover that one? Yeah, so I guess as being part of this new team, we were kind of told to act like a startup, which is sometimes really good advice and sometimes not so good advice. We're really fortunate that um, the gatekeepers of uh, the content data and the audience data that I mentioned in the previous slide are real pros and they, they don't do this, uh, just adopt whatever technology is coolest. They've got really solid products. Um, and as long as we can have a secure environment that we've worked on, um, they can help us to, to, to get the data we want. So, I guess basically we're just really good at cooperating, um, at least at that level. I think I really enjoyed that. I wanted to ask now, based on your experience and how you guys went about it, how would you prioritize which tools to decide on first and then how would you split the tasks? Because this one tool per person didn't seem to work very well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So two, two things, and the first one is um, uh, also answers Max's question from earlier a little bit. Um, ThoughtWorks, uh, uh, ThoughtWorks published this thing called the Tech Radar, uh, which if you haven't seen it is worth checking out. Um, it's a big map, and it shows uh, a lot of the new and up-and-coming technologies and which ones they've already evaluated and which ones they think are good and are bad. So resources like that that are kind of quite thorough um, endorsements of, of what might be good and what might not in general um, are a really good start. Uh, I've forgotten the other thing that I was going to say. Um, but, I mean, 
yeah, just kind of not, well, ah, oh yeah, I remember, right. The other talk that I referenced, Dan McKinley's uh, Use Boring Technology talk, uh, he gives the concept of like, you have three innovation tokens when you start a project. And you can spend them however you like, but you only have three of them. So if you want to try this new database that you think will solve your problem, then that uses up one of your innovation tokens. Um, and so maybe that kind of approach for a smaller team um, would work quite well because you then kind of rationalize everyone's enthusiasm for new things. Um, but it's really tricky, right? It's just, and, and there's probably no substitute for experience as well. Thank John for a really interesting talk. Thank you very much.